Hey ladies and gents and welcome to the Controlled Interest Gamecast, episode 93, where we talk about video games and everything happening in the industry. As always, I'm joined by Jordan. Hola amigo. We haven't been here for a couple of weeks, we had a couple week hiatus. Um, it was just due to some personal things that we, had, uh, that we had going on and then I had some internet issues <laughs> for the last week, uh, so that was great. Um, kind of just two things happen in a row, kind of, you know, life happens. Um, no Dom this week, unfortunately. He had to deal with some personal matters, but we're going to be here. Me and Jordan are going to be talking about a bunch of cool news, um, but let's hop into what we've been playing. Uh, for me, I was telling Jordan before the show, before we started recording, I didn't actually play a whole lot over these last couple of weeks um, just due to internet issues and, you know, that kind of stuff. I'll briefly go over some of the stuff I remember playing. Um, so I've actually played quite a bit of Sea of Thieves, and I was... I, was, I couldn't wait to get on the podcast and talk about it. Um, real quick, I'll just say I think the hate for that game is overblown. I don't think it's a fantastic game. I think it has the problem a lot of living games have is that it, there's not a whole lot of content there. That being said, it's exactly what, what Rare had been promising the entire time. Short gameplay loops, fun on the sea with your friends. They not they, People keep, keep saying it's No Man's Sky and saying all this like ridiculous nonsense. It's like... It, I, I, just, I think it's totally overblown. Loved my time with, uh, with Sea of Thieves. Still playing it. Um, played PUBG, of course. Uh, what else? What else? Uh, played some more Into the Breach. Um, and the biggest thing I'd been playing when, my, when I had my internet issues and I didn't have internet for about a week and a half, um, right before my internet went out, I purchased Ultra Moon. Um, I'd been sitting there and I'd been dabbling with uh, Alpha Sapphire, just doing some like um, Pokemon grinding, catching Pokemon, stuff like that. I'm still working on the Living Decks which is a whole thing I don't want to get into in terms of what that is. But I've been working on that for a long time. This isn't something I picked up like last week when I got Ultra Moon. It's just something that I've been working on with the Poke Bank that's on uh, the 3DS for a while. And I was like, yeah, I've, I'm not really playing anything. I could, you know, work on that. Um, but as far as Ultra Moon goes, um, I like it. It is probably my least favorite Pokemon game I've ever played. <laughs> Did you ever get into Sun or Moon? Uh, no, this is my first time playing su uh, Gen 7. I didn't play... Or, okay, I thought yeah, so. Yeah, Gen 7. Yeah, I didn't play Sun and Moon. Um, f I forgot why I didn't pick it up. And then Ultra Sun and Moon came out, and I was like, okay, if I end up picking them up, I'll pick up the Ultra version, because why would I buy the base version? Um, and I was getting that Pokemon itch, like I said. And I was like, oh, I'll pick up Ultra Moon and start playing it. I like it. Like, I'm not saying I dislike the game. Excuse me. Um, my only issue with it is, so I love the region, like Hawaii, obviously, it's called Alola in the game. Um, right. My biggest issue with it is, I think, uh, and people have this thing of saying, like, uh, Pokemon designs are generic, Gen 1's the best. There have been really cool designs almost every Gen. So far in this sure. game, I'm about four, four hours in, I've beat the first island. Um, there's no traditional gym battles in this game, which I don't have a problem with, it's cool. You know, disrupt conventions, I'm fine with that. That's not the issue I have. My issue is with the narrative of the game. Um, uh, you know, people are going to be like, oh, Pokemon don't really have deep stories or whatever. I still like the narratives of the games. They're simple and they're fun. With this one, it's very weird where, like, I'm constantly being forced into dialogue with this side character. Hey, you've played Moon, right? Or Sun, one of them? Sun. Yeah, l l the Lily character. Um, right. You're constantly, like, I enjoy what's going on with her, but, like, Every time I'm in a new city, you're like, come to a new building. Like, you're constantly being berated with having conversations with her. And, like, this is the first Pokemon game in a while for me where I feel like I'm not able to, like, get to that point in the game where I can go and do whatever the hell I want and I can move around and, and check out stuff. I'm, like, constantly, like, uh, you know, move 10 feet, conversation. Move 10 feet, story conversation. Move 10 feet, main story conversation. Like, I'm constantly feeling like it's, it's, it's stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. And it's not letting me, like, get into the game. Um, and as far as Pokemon designs go, I like the starters. I think they're cool. Um, but there isn't... It seems to be, like, a lot of the Pokedex that I've run into so far is made up of other generations. And I haven't actually gone in and done research. I probably will after the show. I want to see how many original designs they made for this game. Because from what I've seen so far, four hours in, I've maybe seen... I want to say, like... 15 new Pokemon, which is kind of crazy considering it's a brand new generation of video games or you know, brand new brand new generation of Pokemon games like f Seeing 15 new designs is kind of odd for me. I'm expecting to see a lot more and I don't know if the, when they decided to make um, Sun and Moon they didn't want to add a whole lot of new Pokemon because there was already so many um, 
But yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying the game. I'm having a good time with it. I'm still playing it, obviously. But it it is definitely my least favorite Pokemon game that I've ever played. And I've played every generation except for X and Y. That's the only generation I didn't play. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's decent. I'm having a good time with it. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I've been reading All New Wolverine, finished Volume 1. Um, I'm halfway through Volume 2. Uh, finished Southern Bastards Volume 1. Um, I also finished uh, Walking Dead Volume 1. And the other thing I started was um, the Cinegrace Iceman run. Um, nice. I, I just read issue 1 last night. Um, really cool. I like the way they introduced um, the, the series. I like that he's, you know, going on with... Uh, Currently, not currently in Marvel Comics, there's this weird thing that they're kind of trying to fix through Fresh Start and a couple and Legacy and a couple of things, where there was this weird time jump that happened with some character, not time jump, but like universe colliding stuff, where there was younger versions. I think it was the six one six universe. Correct me if I'm wrong, right, Jordan? The six one six universe got pushed into the main canon universe, and that's why like Miles Morales is now with Peter Parker. Um, um I think 616 is the main universe. Or, yeah, sorry. The Ultimate Universe got pushed into the 616 right, right, universe. Right, right. And there was... Uh, so, currently, with, like, the X-Men specifically, there's a young version of Iceman, uh, and there's a young version of Cyclops, and a couple right. of other characters that they're having to deal About with. About to their, send them back. Yeah, they're learning from their older counterparts, and that's where the Cinegrace issue one starts off with, of, of Bobby talking to his younger self, and also you find out that he's gay. And I like the way they went about it. It wasn't a traditional, like, hey, parents, I'm out of the closet. Um, I like that there was a little bit more nuance there of him, like, signing up for this this dating site and not really sure what he's doing. And at the end of it, you know, he realizes that he doesn't really need to go through all the effort of explaining himself to the world. He just kind of puts the shrug emoji, which is pretty funny. Um, but, yeah, I'm enjoying that, enjoying comics. Um, now that I've... Since I didn't have internet, I was a week behind on everything, uh, freelance work and a bunch of other stuff. I'm kind of now at the point where I'm back to where I was before the week hiatus from, like, access to internet. So I'm going to be starting to jump back into um, getting back to finishing Wolfenstein 2 so I can talk to Dom about that next week. Um, and then after that, I'm not sure what I'm going to jump into because... I don't have a PS4, so I can't get God of War. I'm not sure if I'm going to pick up Far Cry 5 yet or if I'm just going to wait since I've already waited this long. Um, but, yeah, it's pretty much it for me. What about you, Jordan? Um, so, since you finished up talking about comics, really, uh, I've been reading a shit ton of comics. Um, I have uh, just about caught up with Walking Dead, uh, since you mentioned it. I am in the middle of the Whisperer War. What issue uh, are they really on? Cool. Sorry to interrupt you. They're in the 170s, right around 175. Okay. And I'm uh, about to hit 160, so I'm very close. Um, and then I've uh, been going through Invincible still. Um, let's see. I started reading The Sandman. Uh, I don't know if you if you know about The Sandman. It's a Neil Gaiman comic. Yeah. Um, in the DC Universe. Uh, it's from you know maybe 15 years ago, but it's uh, pretty well regarded as uh, one of the greats. So I decided to give it a try, and so far it's it's really good. I'm, I think 12 issues in there. Um, finished up Watchmen with the uh, comic book Girl 19 Watchmen Club. Um, so that was my third time reading that. So obviously I already love that book, uh, but it is. Um, I would say it's such a masterpiece that you get something new from it every time, which obviously makes it very special. So um, really enjoyed that. Um, and then kind of just keeping up on uh, the weekly stuff. Uh, shout out to Black Cloud. That's a really cool image comic that is uh, kind of like uh, a good way to put it is um, part of it takes place in a world where imagination becomes uh, reality. Like... Um, you can kind of imagine things into an existence, I guess you'd say. Um, so really cool, really beautiful. Excuse me. Um, and then uh, just read through uh, Batman and the Flash crossover, The Button, uh, which is like in the early 20s of the Batman Rebirth run. Um, and that's pretty good stuff, even though 
really what it is is the the button they're talking about is the watchman pin the you know the smiley face with the blood on it so they're what they're doing is bringing in the watchman to the dc universe and um so i'm pretty wary about that because it's you know obviously i don't think alan moore would be very happy with it but even past that i just think it's kind of a slippery slope they're on there so we'll see how that goes but uh um DC Rebirth is pretty solid overall. I've, I've been reading some of the other books, um, and I do think it's better than New 52. I think New 52 got uh, shit on a little too much, because there was, I mean, obviously people love, like, uh, the Scott Snyder Batman with Court of Owls and stuff like that, but but there was a lot, I think, a lot of good stuff in there that people didn't give um, the right spotlight to just because um, there was some really bad stuff in there. Um, but uh, Rebirth has been good so far. Um, and then there's, you know, some other random weekly stuff. Star Wars Darth Vader and um, stuff like that. But uh, besides comics, uh, I've been playing a bunch of different games since we last talked. Uh, some new releases. Um, you mentioned Far Cry, which I'm enjoying quite a bit. Um, you know, a lot of people, there's kind of a... Um, like a mini controversy on the internet because a lot of people were uh, upset uh, that it didn't touch on or wasn't handling the um, like cult vibes and the political vibes as serious as they thought it should um, and I really wasn't surprised by that at all I thought people were kind of goofy for expecting that like it is a Far Cry game at the end of the day and um, it's about having a good time shooting shit so that's what it is and that's uh, what I like about Far Cry games, why I play Far Cry games, and so that's why I'm enjoying it. Uh, so I really got no problems there. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty much just uh, a great Far Cry game for me, which the last three games have been, uh, other than Primal, which I was not a, not a big fan of. Um, but yeah, I'm enjoying that. And um, so Burnout Paradise Remastered came out, and uh, I think, you know, I'm a huge Burnout fan, Jared. Um, I like Burnout Revenge a little bit more than Paradise, but uh, Paradise is also a game that kind of got a uh, bad rap just because it was a big transition in the Burnout series with Revenge not being open world and then Paradise being open world. Um, I think one of their biggest mistakes was not having Crash Mode, uh, which is probably what made a lot of people dislike it, but uh, really fucking dope game, especially revisiting it now. And... Um, you know, I talk a lot about the Ghost Need for Speed games, which are former Burnout developers. And man, you can just see how much Burnout Paradise was ahead of its time and how it's set up um, the way modern arcade open world racers play, uh, like Need for Speed and Rivals and Payback. Um, so really enjoyed that. Uh, played a shit ton of it I haven't played it in a minute but I mean I, I beat the game and uh you know I've got most of the cars now I think I have like 10 cars left out of 75 so I I, I played the ever living fuck out of that game and enjoyed it quite a bit looked great on the PS4 Pro ran great all that so um then uh I am in the middle of season two of Telltale's Batman uh Enemy Within um on episode three right now so um, so far, I don't like it as much as season one. Um, I think it's got some uh, pacing issues that season one didn't have. Um, but it is still very solid, and I am still enjoying it. Um, but I'm kind of waiting for it to actually go somewhere. And being in the middle of episode three, I think it would be about time that you'd want to um, get that going. So, um, enjoying that, though, and I'm sure I'll have... A different opinion once I actually finish all five episodes so um, and then uh, finished watching the third season of the path uh, the first season of Star Trek Discovery which was um, pretty cool show I think it's uh, a great show really it's um, I think it's got a good balance between like the heady sci-fi of Star Trek and then the more uh, action heavy stuff of like the newer Star Trek movies um, so I did enjoy it, and of course it's it's solid sci-fi, so I like that. It's got really uh, great um, cinematography when it comes to the space stuff. 
the battles and the ships floating out in space and stuff. It looks really fucking good for a TV show. So um, enjoyed that. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of everything for you. Nice. Seems to get a, a, a busy couple of weeks. I mean, we hadn't done the podcast in like, I think two weeks or three weeks. So we had a lot to catch up on in terms of what we were playing. We hadn't done the podcast for two, and I think I hadn't been there for three. Cause oh, I yeah, you're right. Able to make it. Yeah. So it's kind of for you, it's been a w- way longer hiatus. Um, right, right. Yeah, so that's it, it for everything we've been playing. Um, we can hop into the news now. Um, we've got a couple of news stories. Um, in terms of like, happening this week there wasn't a whole lot so we're going to kind of talk about some new stories we missed over our hiatus here from the podcast um but the first thing is actually very current it happened the day of recording this god of war is receiving like crazy critical reception uh the embargo's up on reviews it's receiving tens from the likes of ign easy allies a bunch of other outlets it's currently sitting at a 94 on metacritic which is really impressive um this thing is is trending higher than horizon zero dawn um, which is also really impressive. Yeah. Um, I, I know that you and Dom are probably going to be purchasing this on release day on the 20th. I obviously don't own a PS4 oh, yeah. yet, uh, but I will be purchasing this game when I own a PS4. Um, what are these, are these review scores? Is it something you expected? Like, how do you feel about this critical reception the game's receiving? So, uh, I didn't know about it until Dom messaged us today. Um, but it was mostly what I expected, to be honest, because the way that Corey Barlog specifically has been talking about this game, um, he's been doing a lot of podcast interviews recently. So hearing him on uh, Beyond and Kind of Funny Games cast, um, and then you know all the stuff before that, I could just tell that this was going to be a pretty special game. And, and looking at it, you can see that as well, looking at the gameplay. Um, so, yeah, I'm have been very excited about it you know i'm a huge god of war fan and don't really have as many of the complaints that other people do about uh kratos being so one-dimensional and stuff i kind of push that to the side and it doesn't uh upset me as much as it does other people so i probably would have played it even if it hadn't been like this but nonetheless i think it's a good idea to take the series in a new direction because it would get stale um and so I'm really excited for it. I'm hoping that, you know, since I didn't already have an issue with the current state of the franchise, that it won't be uh, too different for me, even though usually, you know, I'm, I'm pretty adaptable and pretty flexible with that type of stuff. But um, regardless, I'm, I've been excited for it. I am excited for it. Can't wait to play it. So, um, but yeah, mostly what I expected. I did think it was going to be a uh, very high reviewing. I mean, you know, if nothing else, it's a Sony first-party title, which are almost always reviewed very highly, so that's not too much of a surprise. Yeah. I, I think the cool thing is, I think the games have kind of been a reflection of Corey Barlog's personality, or maybe his 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 current position in life. Uh, I think the, the first, tr- right. the, the trilogy, and obviously the spinoffs and stuff are kind of a reflection of him being a young developer and designer, wanting to prove a point and making just a badass game with really cool, fun combat. Um, and I think right. now that he's older, I think this kind of tone that it's shifted to is a more mature tone, more story driven. Sure. Um, you know, obviously it's focused on a relationship between a father and a son, which is very personal mm-hmm. to Corey Barlog. I think it's it's a it's a good shift for the series and. I think the thing with these kind of things is if it is such a departure for some people where they missed what God of War was, you still have those games. Like, those games aren't going anywhere. Right. There's plenty of them. I think, if anything, this is a great open door for people who maybe were turned off by those games, play this game, love it, and are like, I want to see the legacy from which this game was built, and they can go back and play right. those games as well. So, um, I'm, yeah. I'm a fan of God of War 2. I played God of War and God of War 2, loved them to death. Um, by God of War 3, I don't think I was primarily playing on a Sony console, so I never got around to it. Um, then I never played, like, Ghost of Sparta or Ascension. Um, 3 was actually partially yeah. written in partnership, or 2, sorry, was written in partnership with his dad, who's an author, which I didn't know. Corey Barlock's dad. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, 2 and 3 are fucking amazing games. I mean, I like them all, but 2 and 3 are really fucking good. Yeah, I loved 2. I, I remember 2 very fondly. 1 was, I think, fun, but <laughs> in comparison, wasn't a very good game to 2 anyways. Uh, I didn't play 3, like I said. Um, the next bit of news here, uh, during the pre-show, I actually didn't bring this up, but I wanted to add this to the news story. We can not have to talk about it too long, 
But during Inside Xbox, which is Xbox's new monthly show where they dive into new game announcements or new details on their upcoming releases, um, their second episode happened this month, and they talked about a lot of really cool things coming to backwards compatibility. Um, they showed off a bunch of Star Wars titles, including Jedi Academy, the uh, first and second Battlefront games, the original ones, um, KOTOR 2, the first uh, Knights of the Old Republic is already on backwards compatibility. As, as, uh, uh, there was a bunch of other uh, Star Wars titles on there as well. Um, also Jade Empire, uh, Conqueror's Bad Fur Day, not Bad Fur Day, Conqueror's, I don't remember the name of it. Uh, it's escaping me, I wish I had the list in front of me. Anyways, a huge list of games that are coming this month. On top of the fact that uh, Red Dead Redemption, the original, got a 4K enhancement for Xbox One X. And the, I don't know if you've seen the graphics comparison, Jordan, but the improvement is amazing. It's really cool what they well, did. Well, that's what I was going to say. I think it's awesome that you're getting these backwards compatible games, but it's even more awesome that they're, like, really enhanced, a good old-fashioned upgrade. Like, yeah. And they are big fucking upgrades. Like Jade Empire, they showed, like, the, you know when they do that classic thing where it shows the gameplay and then it comes from left to right and slides the new the new. Uh, up res right, version over right. it, and Jade Empire looked like it's crazy. Like it looked, it looked way better than the original would if it was just simply emulated. You know, it's crazy what they do. I remember technology. seeing uh, Oblivion, Elder Scrolls Oblivion, a few months back, and I was very pleased with how that looked. So. Yeah. Good on them, man. It's great that it's not only backwards compatibility, like you're not just able to play these old games, but there are improvements to them, which is awesome. Right. And the technology behind it when they explain it, how it just does it, and the whole systems, it's, it's crazy. It's really impressive. Um, yeah. So some good news for Xbox in a week where PlayStation is getting all of this love for God of War, which they deserve because the game looks like it's phenomenal. Um, but speaking of PlayStation... Um, the couple of weeks that we weren't recording, there was these rumors going around of the PlayStation 5 um, on this website called, uh, I think, Semi-Accurate or Slightly Accurate. Very bad name for the website. Semi, yeah. um, it's, a sub- it's fucking weird. It's a subscription-based news site, uh, and it's $1,000 to enter the website and get through the pay gate. Um, but anyways, they had some information on their website um, pointing to uh, PlayStation 5. It was actually called the Epsilon Project, I believe. Um and it was just showcasing the technology that might be in it. And some people were kind of feeling as if it was a little bit fishy. Like, uh, Reset Era was all over it, saying, yeah, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't make sense. Um, but in terms of actual information, Jason Trier came out and kind of nerfed all of the discussion. Um, or so we think, if his, his, his sources are to be believed. Uh, he states in his tweet, A rumor last week suggested that the PlayStation 5 would be out in 2018. But that's probably not going to happen. Here's everything I've heard about Sony's next machine. And uh, he has a he's a quote here from his article. I don't want to read the entire thing. If you want to read it, definitely go over to Kotaku.com and read the article. Jason Trier puts up some of the most phenomenal pieces about video games in the industry. Like his Fall of the Star Wars game. Uh, I forgot the exact title of it. The Visceral situation was an incredible piece. Um, but he goes on to say about the PlayStation 5. Over the past month, I've spoken to dozens of game developers across a variety of disciplines and studios about the next generation of consoles. Of those, two people said they were directly familiar with plans for Sony's new console. Those two people both told me that the next PlayStation is unlikely to release in 2019. Keyword there, unlikely. Uh, let alone 2018. Although they were careful to be clear that these plans are always shifting on a multi-year project. A lot can happen to shift schedules both forward and backward. One person said, at some point, Sony's probably looked at every possible date. It's all about what they think is the best spot in terms of hardware. A surprise move by Microsoft or another competitor. Let's be real, Microsoft's the only other real competitor. Uh, for example, could trigger a change of plans. And the reason I say only Microsoft is because the Switch came out a year ago. You know, We're not going to see a new Nintendo yeah, console. And it's vastly underpowered. Exactly. And the way Steam machines uh, are got canned, we're not going to really be saying anything there. Um, what do you think about this? I kind of, I, I kind of want to believe his sources. I think a single PlayStation 5 in 2018 was highly unlikely. Um, 2019, I personally don't think, is, is going to happen either. But, like he goes on to say, you never know. These projects are multifaceted and, you know, moving. Um, the weird argument I have, and you can touch on this if you want when you talk about what this means to you, Jordan, but people are saying, like, yeah, the PlayStation 5 has to come out next year in terms of 2019. People are saying there's no way Sony would let Microsoft have the most powerful console in the market for over a year. And they're it's like, it's a weird 
conversation about like, well, if the PS5 doesn't come out, would they release like a Pro 2 or a Pro Plus? And that doesn't mean it, it, dumb arguments. Is I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. <laughs> boil it down to. Yeah. Um, wh- what do you think? Is is this? Are these sources to be believed? Or are we not seeing the PS5 in 2018, let alone 2019? Well, the whole uh, letting Microsoft have the most overpowered or most powerful console thing is stupid to me. Yeah. But <laughs> I agree. I still believe. I still believe it's coming next year. Um, because regardless of who releases first, Sony or Microsoft, the way things are going now, 2020 is looking like, you know, technology is going to be in such a place where you're not going to want to have these consoles still on the market. And so I just think that uh, 2019 is a good spot. That means you're at six years uh, with the life cycle. Uh, and not even really the life cycle, but the you know uh, gestation period of, of PS4, let's say, for example, being out there on its own until PS5 comes out, because, of course, the consoles stick around for a couple years afterwards. But, um, yeah, I just think that, you know, the consoles could have been a little bit better powered even when they came out, but uh, especially with the way 4K is going, um, I just think that, yeah, they're, they're going to look... It's just going to look rough, man, in 2020. You know, if they come out fall 2020, that means um, the first uh, eight, maybe even ten months of 2020, they're just like, console gaming is going to be so far behind a lot of other tech industries. And, you know, Sony and Microsoft particularly, they have... uh, the weight of the console industry on their shoulders as far as it being uh, technologically advanced enough to stand up next to other industries, you know, so um, they're not going to want their industry to be looking uh, left in the dust, you know. Yeah. Uh, gaming is always one of the more cutting-edge technology fields, so I, I just think it would be, um, I just think it would be a bad decision to wait that long. But so... Uh, I I am I'm of a different light of view. I think we do see them see them next year, uh, both the next Xbox and the PlayStation. I don't. I'm of the mind that we see it at the end of the year and then they get released in 2020, um, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. At this point, it's a crapshoot. We really don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you make a lot of valid points in terms of technology and where they're going to stand in the market. Um, but yeah, it's just it's tough, man. We we really don't know what they're doing. The whole like mid. It's it's weird because you know Xbox One X and PlayStation Pro. To me, are really no like obviously they're they're more powerful consoles than the ones that came before them, but in a lot of ways they're no different than like the Xbox Elite, which isn't necessarily the slim. Like, I think they're just you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that console generations are disappearing. Um, if I had a bet, I would say no. If I if I were to bet, I would say if I'm putting my money down, I think we're gonna see PlayStation Five at the PlayStation. Uh, I just. Brain fart. What's the name of the PlayStation event that happens every year? Experience. Exactly. I think we're going to see the play, uh, PlayStation 5, the PlayStation Experience next year, towards the end of the year. Microsoft, it's tough. Now that they have this monthly show, they can really do it at any point, which kind of gives them a lot of flexibility. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of tinfoil hats saying that the month that they decided to start the show, they did on purposely because next March there's going to be a big announcement for like the one-year anniversary of the show. Um, but that's like tinfoil hiding there. Um, yeah, I'm, my vote's 2020, your vote's 2019, that we see at least one of them come out, um, but we'll see. People who thought it was 2018 are crazy. I'm all with hearing you for 2019, Jordan. People who thought that there was going to be a PlayStation 5 released this year are asinine. Well, I think you could have made an argument for that last year. Well, not, but yeah, sitting but sitting in the month of April <laughs> exactly. saying, oh, yeah, none of it's announced, but it's going to be out by the end of this year. You're fucking stupid. Yeah, That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So I would say um, one other thing is that I think I'm really hoping, man, whenever these fucking consoles come out, please make them modular. modular yeah. Make them so that they're basically like a gaming PC, but they are about 10 to 20 times easier to upgrade parts in. So what it is, is you have your PlayStation 5, right? Let's just say PlayStation, for example. And it's really easy to open up. You know, you just flip this thing open. um, And it doesn't, like, fall fall open all the time. Like, the hood doesn't just pop open. But you kind of just, like, unclip something. It opens up. 
excuse me, and you've got four or five pieces that just slide in and out. Yeah. So you have your maybe your video card, your sound card, your hard drive, and something else there um, that Sony and Sony alone can make proprietary parts for that say two or three years down the road you just slide a new piece in and the box stays the same and 10 years down the road you still have the same box because uh, short of dropping it on the ground really nothing's going to go wrong with it because it is that just that a box that has connectors really um, for these modular parts and you know Microsoft could do the same thing where there's not like third party modifications and shit like that that's not going to work but they basically just allow you to buy a Sony uh, part, um, proprietary part, that uh, you slide in, There, it's uh, once you slide it in, close the hood, and then boot it up, it's as simple as doing an update just like we do it nowadays, um, and I mean, does that not sound simple enough for the basic consumer, you know, where it's literally just slide it in and out, and then update your console, and you're good to go. Yeah, I do think, though, that the, when we see that, the first time we see it, Companies are too scared to make that their only SKU. I think if anything, it'll be there will be two SKUs at release. One that's like the the class the classic or whatever the family edition, the the normal consumer average consumer edition. It's just the box and it runs right. It'll get outdated. It'll get old. And I would love that because I don't think they'd ever do the modular one out of the gate by itself. Unfortunately, just the way old corporate dudes are, I don't think they really trust in that. Um, but I would love if that came out right. The normal one we're used to, and then right next to it, they're like. Well, if you're somebody who, you know, uh, I'll even pay like a $50 premium for it in comparison to the base model if they're like, you know, it's modular, right? Um, and if, like you said, everything you just said, being able to upgrade it on your own and stuff like that, um, I would love that. I really hope that that's where they start focusing the iterative versions in between generations. Um, graphics are cool and everything, and I'm down with 4K and stuff like that, but like the modular stuff is way more interesting to me of being able to upgrade my console and spending money on that than spending money on uh, a, a, you know, a, a better running con- I don't know. It's I'd rather spend money to upgrade the console I have to run games better than to pay a whole, pay for a whole new console that just boosts all right. that stuff, if that makes sense. Um, now, I would actually disagree with you on the front of uh, there being two SKUs. Uh, because that, to me, just cons- complicates the situation. I want it to be so simple that your fucking grandma. Could no, do it. I I wanted to, now, but the, I just I don't I would I couldn't see a world where the first game that happens, it at release it would be just the modular console. I could see, for instance, just playing with this PS5 new Xbox come out Xbox Two right. They're the same old shit we're used to. Unfortunately, they get old. Then when it comes to the iterative stage, they're both like, hey, let's introduce this modular thing, right? Say that happens. Then I could see PS6 and Xbox 3 or whatever the hell it is, those launching as modular from the start. I just don't see, without us having experience or them having experience with that technology, out of the gate saying, you know, it's modular. Out of the two companies, too, I think Microsoft would be more ballsy to do it now with Phil Spencer than Sony would. I think Sony would probably go the more traditional route and then do an iterative version of it. But we'll see. Sure. Yeah. My thing is just that uh, the reason I wouldn't have the two SKUs is because, um, let's say, PlayStation 5 is what we're talking about, this modular console. If you're not, if you're a basic-ass consumer who just wants the thing to play a couple times a year and isn't going to upgrade it, you're not going to even know a difference. Like, it's very simple. It doesn't look like, you know, it doesn't have a giant fucking hinge on the side, so you're like, what the hell is this? Like, I get what you're saying. If you don't know it's modular, you'll not even worry about it. I get what you're saying. It's not even going to affect you. Exactly. Because, yeah. like, basically that's kind of how it is now. We're like, uh, I guess you can't do this with Xboxes, but, like, um, with the PlayStation 3 and 4, um, you know, it's just a couple screws and you're in there switching out your hard drive. So, like, the basic consumer doesn't really know anything about that. But for me, it's pretty easy, and I have done it, uh, to swap out a hard drive, and now it's got two terabytes in there. So Yeah, you have a valid um, argument. I see you there. Technically... Yeah. I completely see technically, that. Technically, they are the PlayStation Four and the PlayStation Three were both modular consoles because you could easily upgrade them um, in a way that you know Sony officially endorses. Um, and for the basic consumer, they're none the wiser, and it doesn't affect them. And they're not like, well, what's this screw hanging off the side or this hinge, whatever? 
I just um, they don't even know the difference. So. I think my only concern with it, and I'm talking about the average base consumer that doesn't know anything, because like us, even if we don't hear the modular part is like the main marketing thing, we look into stuff and like, oh no, it's modular, it's awesome, right? But with a cons- yeah. like a normal ass consumer, if they walk into like not walk into the store, if they see the commercial and like it's talking about it being modular, they're immediately old people who know, have none the wiser are gonna be like. Oh, so I have to pay for this console, and then I have to continuously pay more money for it. I don't want that, which that can muddy the message yeah. too. Um, yeah, but I think it could be just as confusing to have two screens. Oh, I, I agree. You, know, you I make a very valid point. Working at GameStop, it's like, well, what's the difference between the white Wii U and the black Wii U? Which there was an actual difference with hard drive size and and like getting a thirty percent discount. Unfortunately, though, like the average like consumer that. is not that bright. So even if you try your best and do everything you can to make sure things aren't confusing. There's a, there's a high chance that ten percent of the people coming in to buy that thing are going to be confused no matter what you do. So, That's a good point. yeah, That's a good point. Um, let's hop into our next story here. This got me super excited. We finally got the announcement of Spyro Reignited, the trilogy remaster. It's being done by Toys for Bob, which are the guys who are familiar with Skylanders. They worked on those games, so Activision kind of put them on this project. Probably as it's weird that they didn't just go straight to Vicarious <clears throat> Visions, who did uh, Crash Insane. Yeah, I think maybe if I'm if I'm thinking about this, it's like it's an internal studio for Activision, so I think it's like they think they're capable enough. They have lots of experience with Spyro as a character, even though the the Skylanders version of him is pretty much pretty different than like his his titular games. Um, maybe right. it's just like saving money, not having to worry about splitting revenue. I don't know. But isn't Vicarious first party Activision? Is well? it? I'm not. I'm not familiar with who they're I'll owned check by. That out. Yeah, um, you could be definitely right about. It. Maybe Vicarious is working on the. Maybe they gave them the actual new Crash game. Crash game, yeah. And they couldn't work on this either. Um, but the most exciting thing, Jordan, it's coming out on my birthday. It's coming out on September twenty first, and Sony didn't lock this up. This bad boy is coming day and date on Xbox One and Xbox One X, um, which I'm even more excited for. Uh, by this time, I'll own a PS4, but. Control-wise, I'll probably want to play it on an Xbox. I just I'm more comfortable with the Xbox controller. I don't know. Maybe by that time, playing Spider-Man and stuff, maybe I'll, which we'll get into in a bit. I'm just super excited for the release date. I'm like, I've been winding this game. I've talked about it on the podcast, and it's coming out on my birthday, which is awesome. One of the weird universe Shout coincidences. Out, Shout out. Yeah. So, uh, Vicarious Visions was acquired by Activision in 2005. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I'm assuming they're probably just working on the new Crash game or something. Uh, or a different remaster so. or something like that. Um, man, a new Crash game. 2018, what a weird Let's time that would it, be. Bro. Hey, new Crash game, and then we're going to Jack 4, baby. Hell yeah. Hey, maybe Vicarious Visions is working on a, a, a Jack remaster. Um, to the dummy. Start, <laughs> start, start, it's going to be pricey. I'm just glad I got uh, the greatest game of all time, Jack X Combat Racing, on the PlayStation 4. Hell yeah. Uh, it's going to be priced at $40, just like the Crash trilogy was. Um, yeah, there's not much else to say. I'm super excited. I love Spyro so dang much. Um, yeah, is there anything else you want to touch on with Spyro? Not really. It looks good, you know, just like it looks on the same level as the Crash uh, remakes did. And, um, you know, there's some minor, minor issues that people had with the Crash remakes, like the the feet being a little bit different and so your your uh, hit boxes are a little bit weird on the jumping the platforming um, but other than that I think they did a really solid job and um, I think that Toys for Bob is an experienced enough studio and it seems like the Skylanders games you know the even though that most people like us don't really mess with them they, they seem like competent enough video games so um, I'm very excited to see this. Uh, I love both Crash and Spyro. Spyro, I've got good memories of, uh, you know, waking up early to play on my cousin's PlayStation, uh, just because I thought, man, it's a fucking purple dragon. It's cool as shit, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm excited to. I'm excited to get back to that, and I'm. I'm glad that uh, that this is happening. One quick thing, uh, kind of side tangent, but definitely related. This is great, great proof. And we've seen this, I think we've started seeing plenty of examples of, it, of this over the last couple of years especially. If the fans want it bad enough, it's going to fucking happen. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, the Crash remakes, now the Spyro remakes, there's a hundred other examples of, like, if we push hard enough, it is going to fucking happen. 
Last Guardian is a good example of that. Um, Final Fantasy VII Remake is a perfect example of that. Um, so, and you can even read stories of, you know, interviews with developers or publishers talking about that. Like, eventually we just had to fucking do it because people wouldn't shut the fuck up. So, if you want something bad enough, especially if you want something to come back bad enough, just keep putting it out there, man, and it's going to happen. You know, it will happen. Well, speaking so speaking of pushing about it, and I guess before I get into that, I just want to say that Spyro is such an accessible game, and I think it does such a good yeah. job of being accessible to kids in a non overhand holdy way. You know, I think it's yeah. just like a very easily digestible game where you can teach people how to play video games, and uh, yeah, I'm excited for this. This is definitely, like, if I ever do have kids... This the Spyro trilogy is a I want them to play this if they want to play video games kind of thing. It's one of the games I want them to touch in their lives. Um, Absolutely, sure. But you, know, you got to take them through all the different mascot platforms. You got to go Crash. Of course, you got like Mario and shit, but you got to go Crash and Spyro. I ain't passing on Jack and Dax here now. They're playing that too. You go, no, no, I'm saying you got to go with Jack and Ratchet yep. and Sly, and then you could even you know. If you're a sadistic bastard, you could introduce him to Knack at some point. Well, their third game was going to be Dark Souls, no matter what. I'm just kidding. Uh, oh, shit. <laughs> like a little three. Jared's a tough dad. Yeah. Um, running through the Soulsborn legacy. Um, um, anyways, speaking of, you know, you were talking about how if fans want it enough, it happens. An interesting thing uh, is, you know, we got Insomniac Games working on a Spider-Man game. We got the release date, yep. which I'll get to shortly. But um, hearing their interview with Game Informer, they actually pitched their idea to Marvel, which I didn't know. Uh, they they went to Marvel and said, hey, you're in the business of making video ga- AAA video games now. We think we can make a Spider-Man game. And they pitched... So it wasn't Marvel going, hey, Insomniac's great, and they just made Sunset Overdrive, which feels kind of like Spider-Man. Yeah, uh, yeah. they basically they, they pitched it to Marvel. And maybe it's somewhere in the middle of like... Sony and Marvel talked to them like, hey, can we make a Spider-Man game? Or Marvel's like, we want you to make a Spider-Man game. And they're like, can we have Insomniac pitch you a game? And that's Insomniac pitching Marvel and make sure everything's yeah. square. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we got the release date, so September 7th, which means that I'm possibly going to have... I'm trying to remember. Do you remember the release date for Rise... Not Rise of the Tomb Raider, uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Shadow. It's September as well, isn't it? I think it is September... Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it's September fourteenth. So that means in three straight weeks, it's Spider well, it's actually Dragon Quest eleven, September fourth, Spider Man September seventh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider September fourteenth, and then Spyro September twenty first. So September is a very busy mm. month. Very busy month. That means we're getting closer and closer to games finally being released in the fucking summer, Jerry. Getting closer, step by step, day by day. Um, yeah, I've exactly. talked about this is a game I'm going to be purchasing a PS4 for, so I will have a PS4 by September 7th. You can bookmark that, write it down, send that check to the bank. I can't wait, Jared, and I can't wait. we got to have a topic when you do about, you know, what games you got to play. I already have a list, man. I have Bloodborne. Yeah. I have Ratchet & Clank, which those two I got for PlayStation Plus. Um... I'm definitely getting God of War. I'm not going to get them all at once, though, because obviously I'm not a, I'm a responsible spender. But there is a list of games Horizon. I definitely want to get to uh, that I didn't have the fortune of playing. Um, Did you ever finish Last of Us? Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what was I going to say? So with Infamous Second Son, baby. <laughs> uh, with Spider-Man, um, we got a lot of news and a lot of information. Um, so the first thing is that we kind of got to look at the web swing a little bit more, uh, look at how that functions. It's momentum-based. It's pendulum physics-based. Um, Everything that they were saying in that video, I was like, yep, yep, you guys fucking get it. Exactly. You guys fucking know what you're doing, uh, man. For those of you wondering, the game has zero microtransactions. Um, the suits in the game, if you want to be your own Spider-Man and go through the game how you want to look, um, there's uh, materials and stuff you gather throughout the game, and you actually craft suits. Um, there's going to be a ton of suits, uh, more than like 40 some, it looks like, according to Game Informer. By the way, all of this information is by yeah. Game Informer. Go look at their coverage. They got the exclusive stuff off the bat, and it's, it's incredible all the stuff that Insomniac shared with them. Um, so for pre-ordering the game, you're getting uh, three exclusive suits. Um, when they announced the release date, they showed off Punk Spidey, 
Uh, and today, the day of recording this, they showed off the second of the three suits, and it's the Iron Spider suit from Avengers Infinity War, specifically, not the comics version, but the movie yeah, version. Yeah. And it looks, like I told Jordan before the show started, it looks clean. It looks great. Um, another piece of information that's really interesting, some people don't like the, the white spider on the chest. Um, you actually don't start the game with that suit. You start in the traditional Tobey Maguire-esque, you know, the classic the classic Spider-Man suit everybody's used to. And the white, the white spider and his upgrades on his suit have a narrative reason. There's a reason he has a new suit after a point in the beginning of the story. Um, which obviously they didn't want to spoil. Um, they said there's a ton of the rogues gallery in the game because obviously you can't have a Spider-Man game without showing off all of his different villains. The interesting thing, they asked him point blank, is villain in this game? And the creative director said, he's an interesting character. So, um... Wait, what? Is who in this game? Venom. I thought you said villain is villain. Oh, sorry, no. They asked if Venom in this game, and the creative director simply replied, he's an interesting character. Um, Honestly, dude, you're talking about having the rogues gallery. I would love it if they were just like, nah, dude, it's one It's one guy. Yeah. It's one one of the solid ones, of course, you know, Green Goblin or Venom or somebody like that, uh, Doc Ock. But uh, I would like it if they were like, no, it's just the one dude, and then game two is just one dude, and then maybe game three is like Sinister Six or something like that, you know. But I, I, I am a little bit worried about them blowing their load on the vil, uh, villains in this one game. Yeah. It seems, from what they said... Because we know Kingpin's in there. Kingpin's a big Spider-Man villain, you know. Yeah, so. Kingpin's in there. We know uh, Harry's in there, obviously, Osborne, uh, Mr. Negative, and Shocker, I think, is the right. only other villain we've actually huh. seen. So we haven't seen Vulture. Yeah. We haven't seen most of the Sinister Six. Carnage Venom. Um, I would love Doc if Ock. if Venom is tangentially in this game, and then he's the the primary bad for the second one. Um, well, and then you know you gotta wonder about Miles Morales. He's in this game, so is he gonna become Spider Man in this game? Is he just gonna be uh, Peter's buddy in this game? You know what's going on there? So. Exactly. Oh, another. Because I'm hoping this is a franchise. Exactly. You know? I hope so too. I hope this is at the bare minimum uh, a trilogy. Um, the other thing, the other bit of information, uh, Mary Jane is playable in this game. Um, mm -hmm. So they talked about how she's going to be playable at certain parts during the game. They said that you also play as Peter, which is like a weird throwaway, but some people assume that maybe all the Peter Parker scenes were like just cutscenes. Uh, no, there's there's points in the game where you play as Peter outside of the suit. Um, there's right. some interesting stuff. I don't know how deep I want to get into the information for people who don't want it spoiled, um, but I guess this is a partial spoiler, not a huge spoiler. Um, one of the, because it's an open world game, you're going to have uh, tasks around, obviously, New York City. Um, a certain selection of tasks are going to be by the Taskmaster, um, which I don't think that's really a spoiler. Um, it's kind of fitting, obviously, too, yeah. with his name and stuff. Um, but yeah, there's so much to dive into in terms of what this game's going to be. I was at about, I would say, an 8 for this game. Maybe a 7, right? Uh, once all this, I would say an 8. Once all this Game Informer uh, information and footage came out and all of the, the gameplay we're seeing and how beautiful the game looks, uh, I'm up to a 10. I'm, I changed my Twitter banner to it. I changed my, my computer wallpaper to it. I'm super stoked. I, there's a photo mode, which is awesome. Um, a cool workaround to uh, not being able to injure civilians is that the uh, attack button when you're near civilians turns into the interact button. So it's like, ha like handshakes, greetings, you know, celebrate with a civilian take a selfie with the civilian um yeah just a bunch of cool stuff the the web swing i think is one of the most key parts of a spider-man game of everything i've seen the way it works it's simple enough that the average joe can go in and have a fun time to swing from building to building but if you sit there and you get good at it you can get real good um because there's different ways that you interact with vaulting and slinging your web and running off of certain uh building it just it looks incredible. I, I really like that uh, every time you shoot a web, it connects to something. Yeah. It's not like in the old games where it's just going in the air. The air. Like <laughs> it has to connect to the top of a building or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, before we close out and we talk about what we're going to be playing next week, what's one thing that you don't know about the Spider-Man game that you hope is a part of it? Mm, that's a good question, Jared. Well, I mentioned whether or not Miles is going to become Spider-Man. I, I am very... Because this is an older uh, Peter. He's uh, 10 years into the into the suit. We'll just let that be known. I thought it was like 5 or 7. I, I'm pretty sure it's 10. 
Uh, okay. Well, either way, um, I am excited to see what the deal is with Miles. Um, hmm. Ooh, here's a good one. I know that they're not uh, connected to the MCU or anything like that, but is Iron Man going to show up in this game? Is Cap going to show up in this game? You know, is Hulk going to run through this game? Like, just because they're not trying to necessarily build a franchise and have, like, you know... Sorry to interrupt you, eight years. Or something. Eight years. Eight years. Yeah. Okay. So, even if they're maybe not trying to make a Thor game next or something like that at Insomniac, it would be cool if they had their own little universe and it's like, well, we're only making Spider-Man games, but, you know, doesn't mean that the fucking Avengers can't run through this bitch. Doesn't mean that uh, the Fantastic Four can't be around, you know? Yeah. Because I am very, um, pondering very hard what the deal is with, you know, are they... Um, gonna make it pretty insular and it's like New York City really just Spider-Man and then the spider kind of family with MJ and Miles and people like that or are they gonna make it the Marvel Universe but we're only making Spider-Man games so um, interesting I'd like to see interesting tidbit in one of the trailers that the Game Informer released you see Avengers Tower Mm. Yeah, I forgot. I, didn't, I thought you knew that. Yeah, you see, like, clear as day, you yeah. see the Avengers Tower in the game. And they actually asked okay. him, like, Yeah, that's important. What's this building with the A on it? And they're like, mm, Never seen it before. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, and then we have, obviously, we have Square Enix and Crystal's uh, Avengers game coming up. And though they said it's not a connected universe in terms of they don't directly interact with one another, it'd be cool if they paid homage to one another, you know? Maybe. Uh, maybe uh, we also don't know Spider-Man is a huge part of the Avengers in the comics not so much in the MCU until of late when Sony gave them the rights to be able to use him is the Avengers game going to have their own Spider-Man you know what I mean we don't know that yet yeah 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 so that would be a clear like if we see uh, Crystal's uh, Avengers game at E3 this year and we don't see Spider-Man then we kind of have an idea of oh they really don't want those streams crossing of um they, they don't want two, two of the same character and get people confused, so maybe there is a loose tie in there, you know what I mean? Not directly connected, but maybe they yeah. pay homage to each of them. Um, it's going to be very yeah. interesting to see how this all plays out, because... Are we seeing gameplay of that uh, Avengers game this year, Jared? Uh, I'm saying yes. I'm, I think we're seeing it okay. on Microsoft stage. Uh, I think we're seeing it. I, don't, I think we're going to get a... Z3. I think we're going to get a, 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 a year window. I think we're going to get uh, 2019 or 2020. If I guess we wouldn't see 2020 because it's too far out. I'll say we'll see 2019 on the trailer. I'll go with that. Because, remember, Crystal's working on this and Eidos is helping them. So it's like two pretty large studios working on this game. Yeah, it's weird, you know, how they've also got Shadow coming out. It's like, I don't know, it's weird, but yeah. who knows. Yeah, we don't. All... Square Enix is great at handling studios and publishing games. <laughs> guys, so. Exactly, their their Western front is pretty good, for the most part. Yeah, well, that's because they're really not as much in charge. Exactly, of that. they kind of just are the ones that are uh, fronting the money for that. But we'll see. Yeah, for me, I guess the one thing I want to see that we don't know about yet. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm glad this isn't an origin game. Great, super happy about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going with your cross. Glad it's not tied into a movie, Jared. It, yeah, that too. Uh, going over your your whole crossover thing, um, it's it's interesting because you know people say that why would they do that? Doesn't make sense. It's never people don't do that. That why would they ever do that? What the MCU did was never done before either, as effectively and as big as it did, right? And Marvel is kind of ballsy enough to try to pull something off like that too. You know what I mean? And right, right. I think it's like, oh, you know, having Spider-Man, having Insomniac do it, that's a good first step. I don't think it'll ever be like a crazy crossover where it's the same assets and stuff, obviously. But it could be where they're building universes and uh, – or one universe, and you do have the nods to the other games without that character in there necessarily. But then it's like, right. how weird is it to have like a Marvel game with a bunch of superheroes, but it doesn't have Spider-Man in it? You know what I mean? So it's like, well, where does that yeah, line get drawn? I think... The most likely is basically what they did in, uh, uh, fuck, uh, Arkham uh, Knight, where you've got voicemails of Lex Luthor talking to Bruce Wayne. Great, yeah. This 
about this Superman guy and kind of just little Easter eggs here and there and references. Um, but who knows? Well, and it's also I wonder how the 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 assets and stuff who who necessarily owns all of that in terms of like the split of that. So like if Marvel partially owns the Spider Man like assets for Spider-Man PS4, could they use his model, not necessarily for gameplay, but, like, have him in the background of, like, a cinematic shot or something? Like, there's all those weird lines of trademarks and yeah, usage and stuff. But then that automatically connects them, you know? It's yeah. It's like, well, we didn't want to confuse people by making a different I guess you're saying having the voiceover isn't as one-to-one, yeah. Yeah, you either, you either connect them or you don't, and I don't think that uh, Insomniac Spider-Man and Avengers... Square Enix Avengers are going to be connected, so, but I definitely think it's a possibility that Spider-Man can show up in that game, and you know, there's Iron Man or whoever in this one, just different ones. Yeah, I think my one hope for this is I hope that Sandman's in the game. <laughs> Sandman's awful. I, I've never liked Sandman as a as a villain. Yeah, I can't say I share that. No, I, it was a I joke. Mean, I'm okay with Sandman. I'm fine with Sandman, but uh, there's plenty of other Spider-Man. I want a scene where Rhino charges something like a big old idiot and gets hurt because of it. That's what I want. Uh, Good old fashioned slapstick. Exactly. Um, but no, really, I'm super excited for Spider Man. Can't wait. It's the reason I'm buying a PS4. Um, and I get to play that and then Spyro Trilogy within two weeks of each other. What a glorious time to be a video game fan. And then God of War shortly after that, I'm, I, I would assume. I want to try to play God of War before Red Dead Redemption 2, that's for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it for this week's show. Dom will be back next week. Um, as far as what we're going to be playing, um, like I said, I'm back into the routine of I caught up with everything I needed to catch up on. So going to be playing more Ultra Moon, um, see how that goes. I'm going to be finishing Wolfenstein 2 now that I can actually get to that game. It was it sucked too because like I told Dom I was going to finish it, and I started playing it, and I got maybe like two and a half, three hours like farther in. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to smash this game, really enjoying my time with it. And then the whole internet thing happened. I'm like, okay, cool, great. Um, yes. So I'm going to be finishing that, and then I don't know what I'm going to jump to after that. I kind of want to start the Banner Saga, because I started it and stopped. I want to go back and actually start it from the beginning, especially with 3 getting the announcement of coming out in July. Um, I really enjoy the art style of that game and the gameplay. Just I got pulled oh, away yeah. by something. Um, and then next month, I'm not getting God of War. or Sorry, this month I'm not getting God of War, but... Ashen is on the horizon. Ashen was that indie game that kind of looks like Souls-esque, and apparently from early previews, it has Journey-style multiplayer. So, like, there's people that, like, come in and out of your game, and you don't really know which ones are the NPCs and which ones are the actual players. Um, Mm. I'm interested in the price point for that game and early impressions, and I'll decide if I'm uh, at release picking that up or not. Um, But, yeah, I'm really excited just to get back to playing video games, honestly. Um, and I think I'm going to go uh, watch A Quiet Place this weekend as well, if I can get to it. I want to watch A Quiet Place, and I want to watch Rampage. Rampage because it looks like a big, dumb movie, big, dumb, fun movie. And A Quiet Place because I'm interested in seeing that movie. And also, John Krasinski and uh, Emily Blunt should be Mr. Fantastic and Invisible Woman. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Shout out to my girl, Emily Blunt. Um, Sorry, go ahead, Jordan. So I'm really glad that that movie is good because it was one of those movies where like okay this is probably either going to be real great or real bad and it turns out a lot of people are saying it's real great so I'm really glad about that you know I love horror um oh. I'm also trying at some point uh Jordan did you see it Jared go ahead sorry fucking just uh, barrel through you, you said horror movie did you saw it right uh I'm you know Jared I'm fucking trying to make it through that thousand page book oh my god I okay I, I really am so I mean, I'm 400 pages in, you know, at this point. Might as well fucking finish So what I want to say is that I don't want to ruin – I don't know if they will ruin it. It's it. Anyways, the second movie, Chapter 2, is going to take place the second half of the It story when they're adults. So far, right, right. Jessica Chastain is, is in talks to um, take on the role of – is it Barbara? No. What's her name? Is... I'm... Well, there's only one girl. Yeah. So it's... You know who I'm talking about. Her. Uh – Bill Hader is in talks to be adult Richie, which I think is a pretty solid casting uh, for the character, for the Richie they have in the first It movie. And James yeah. McAvoy is in talks to be uh, old, adult Bill. So. Gosh, those all three sound great. Yeah, yeah, all three exactly. 
Um, they're in talks. Nothing's official yet, but super stoked. Sorry. Go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, oh, you're interrupting you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've been trying to get around. I was waiting for reviews to see if it was worth it. I've been trying to get around to see Ready Player One in the theater. It looks like it's good enough to actually warrant going to the theater, especially with the visual presence that it has. So I'll see if I get around to that. Uh, of course, getting super pumped on Infinity War. You and I were talking about how, before the show, how... Um, I'm going to see. We're both going to see it in IMAX. I'm going to see it in uh, the only like true IMAX theater in Tennessee that can actually do 70 millimeter, which there's very few across the country. Um, I don't know if it's actually gonna be in 70 millimeter um, for this one, but what I do know is the reason I'm going to see it there specifically up in Nashville is because this is the first Hollywood film to be shot. 100% in IMAX, so very excited about that. I know it's still a couple weeks away, but uh, I'm getting pumped either way, you know. So, um, there's that. Uh, Have you read the Prelude comic yet? No, you know, the, I'm always torn when it comes to superhero movies, because almost all of them get uh, a little comic tie-in, and it's just like they're they're usually fine and yeah they usually connect or whatever but i don't know a lot of times i'd just rather read like an actual avengers comic you know yeah that you're gonna spend that time i agree with you man exactly so um but yeah getting pumped on that <clears throat> of course god of war comes out next week it's crazy excited about that. we have infinity war and then is it deadpool first or is it uh solo first Solos in May and Deadpool's in June. No, they moved. They moved uh, Deadpool into May. Remember, when Avengers and Infinity War got moved to April, they moved uh, Deadpool two into May. That's interesting. Yeah, I'll double check. Uh, Go ahead. Well, Solos twenty five. May twenty five. Uh, which? Why the fuck, Jared? Is that movie not coming out on May the fourth? I don't know. If you're gonna have it like in May, have it on May the fourth. May eighteenth is Deadpool Are you two. Hitting me. Okay, so Deadpool's next. Awesome. I'm very excited about that. That's fucking Disney. Come on, man. Really? You couldn't figure out three weeks ahead of time how to get the movie in theaters on May the 4th be with you? Get the fuck out of here. Anyways. They don't want it to be eaten alive by uh, Infinity War, I think. I I, I know it's well, Star yeah, Wars, I but... I know that much. I get that. Yeah. I get that, but at the same time, it's like... Um, at the same time, come on now. <laughs> I'm saying they should have done this like years exactly, ago before yeah. Infinity War even had a release date or whatever. Anyway, it's still weird. It's not I'm coming out in December. Movie. I don't know. It's just it's weird. We'll see. We'll see. Well, um, oddly enough, uh, episode uh, seven, Last Jedi, was actually supposed to be last spring, and then they pushed it. To oh, December. you're right. Yep, you're right. Yeah, originally. So, anyways, I'm a little worried about that movie. I'm uh, optimistic, though. We'll see how it is. Of course, I'm going to see it at Star Wars. I've never been a huge Solo fan. I'm still going to watch it because I like Star Wars a lot. But I'm not somebody yeah. who's tied to the the original character so much that it's it bothers me. I'm more excited to see everybody else, especially Donald Glover as Lando. Like, uh, come on. That's that's why. But I'm people who to love to Han Solo, I can totally Lando. understand why they're worried. Completely understand. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I'm just worried about Star Wars in general, just Disney Star Wars in general, especially after Last Jedi. I am, I am shaken to say the least. Jared. Shook. Hashtag shook. Exactly. Um. So I'll be finishing up uh, Batman: Enemy Within. Um, like I said, I'm hoping that game uh, really uh, blows my skirt up by the end of it. Um, and then get back to Far Cry Five, probably. Um, read some more comic books, I'm sure. Um, probably be finished with Walking Dead uh, by next week. Um, which, you know, series finale coming up. There's something worth mentioning. Or not series finale. Season finale. This summer. Hopefully it's not the series finale. Um, Did he get renewed for a new season already? Oh, what season is it currently on? I'll do some research real quick. What's the current season? Eight? Uh, this is eight. Yeah, we're on eight right now. I mean, they're like making plans for ten and further, but... I don't know that I've heard of official renewal, but I'm pretty damn sure. A new awesome. writer, a new showrunner, right? Something like that? For season ten, uh, season 9? I didn't know about that. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Uh, I do not like the, the current one. I think Scott Gimple is his name. Yeah. Do not like Scott Gimple. Uh, let's see here. You probably need a fucking new showrunner. 
He said that following the season eight finale, the series will very much be a new show. Fucking good, man. Fucking good. So I'm sure they're about to do the whispers, and just the biggest thing is the way they change from comic to TV show. Most of the decisions they make and the changes that they do are fucking stupid. They make, they like make the shit from the comics worse. You know what I mean? And I'm sure they're about to do the whispers, and the whispers are really fucking cool in the comics, and I do not want them to fuck that up. So, we'll see. Uh, this week's episode was pretty solid. I'm sure that they'll have a solid uh, season finale because they've had some decent episodes this half of the, this back half of the season. But uh, all I can do is keep my fingers crossed. Um, quick shout out on a show, uh, Jared. You might actually like this. It's a British show called Requiem. Have you heard of it? No. It's a horror show, and you know I love a good real deal horror on TV. Shout out to Outcast. Shout out to Penny Dreadful. Um, Andre 3000. But this one... Sorry. <laughs> you said outcast. It was a dumb joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool because I was talking about So Fresh and So Clean earlier on the show, so you're just leaving the background. Oh, yeah. Um, but anyways, uh, Requiem is kind of this girl who's uh, being haunted, and, and it is a little bit slow in the beginning, but it's still good horror, and uh, I think you'd enjoy it. It's only six episodes, too, which you know I'm all about. That oh, yeah, short and sweet. Killer no filler six eight episodes is all a tv show needs to be this 10 13 episode 16 episode walking dead fucking get out of here. over 12 is six hard for me to even get semi-interested in personally yeah yeah oh yeah oh yeah so yeah that was a quick shout out that was a quick wreck um, that's all I got for you, boy. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining us for episode 93. Glad to be back. Dom will hopefully be back next week. Um, we're, we're trudging into uh, close to E3. Um, we're trying to line up guests for those predictions podcasts that we do every year, so that's going to be cool. Um, yeah, just excited to be back talking about video games. It's been a while, Jordan. Glad to talk with you. Hey, man. Great to be here, Jordan. Hey, now. You're an Thanks all-star. Thanks for having me. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, so if you can, please follow us on uh, on iTunes. Leave us a review if you can. That definitely helps. Um, if you don't know, if you're not familiar, every time somebody like follows the podcast or leaves a review, it moves us up the chart so people can actually see us when they click on games in, in uh, games and entertainment. Um, we know we're not trying to get to the top of the the thing. We'll never be there, but it. You reviewing the show has gives us a higher chance, even if it's one of you, to put us up there and more people can get their eyes on us. If you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, uh, we're putting up more than just a podcast. I put up an impressions video of Monster Hunter World when that came out. I recently put up uh, another, I don't remember the, the other video I put up where I uploaded um, something with Marvel. I can't remember now. Um, but yeah, we do we do a lot of different stuff. We do the podcast as well. Even if you're not going to listen on here and you listen on iTunes or Google Play, it just helps us out uh, a bunch. So definitely do that if you can. Thank you guys, and we'll catch you guys next week in episode 94. We might have a guest, not too sure yet, but we more than certainly will have all three of us back. So, bye.